AI Basics for Managers from Harvard Business Review. There are three types of AI. Now, typically with AI, we tend to think of generative AI these days, doing things like producing digital paintings, producing copywriting. But there are actually three clusters of AI. The first is process automation. And typically what we're on are back office admin and financial activities. For example, I work for a software company in San Francisco called Webgility. And what we did was we automated the transfer of information from one system into another, from Amazon, from Shopify, into QuickBooks, into inventory systems, et cetera. Now, you can also transfer data from other systems. So for example, from email and call center systems into CRMs. You can use process automation for replacing lost credit and debit cards and updating the systems with the customer information. You can use natural language processing to extract provisions from contracts. So maybe something's buried in the fine print. You can use AI to detect that. And as a general rule, you can say, if you can outsource a task, you can probably automate it. Now, I outsource a lot of tasks to Fiverr for things like graphic editing, copy, basic copywriting, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's a, an indicator that you can probably use AI, if not to replace that, to enhance it and make it more productive. Now, the second cluster is using AI to get insight through data analysis. For example, predicting what a customer will buy next. So the next pair of shoes, the next pair of socks, et cetera. It can be used to de detect uh, credit card fraud, and it can be used to personalize the targeting of ads. The third type of AI is where you're actually using the robots to engage with customers and employees. So for example, 24 seven support chatbots. You can have internal sites for where employees can ask questions about their benefits plans, their IT support, et cetera. Or you could have something like a health treatment recommendation system where people receive customized health plans based on the previous treatment that they received. Now, the most common use of AI is making predictions. AI is particularly good at making predictions, predicting who will click, who's going to buy, who's going to lie, who's going to die, who's going to commit fraud, who's going to quit, who's going to cancel their subscription. AI makes predictions better, faster, and cheaper. However, no prediction is 100% accurate. So for example, let's say you're trying to predict future crop yields using AI. When you're trying to predict when a particular machine part will fail and when you're trying to anticipate anticipate guest preferences for something like their hotel room you can get much better at this perhaps than a human can but you're never going to be 100 percent accurate so be prepared for that later i'm going to talk about some huge failures that happen with ai now, the most common AI use case, again, is making predictions, but there are different types of predictions. There's personalized recommendations. There's forecasting long-term loyalty. There's predicting employee performance. And there are things like credit risk ratings. These, are be, these would be prime use cases for the predictive ability of AI. Now, sometimes AI is just used to organize data rather than to make predictions. So, for example, I use cluster analysis for customer segmentation. This is referred to as unsupervised learning because there's no measured outcome that the system can optimize against. Now, here's a case where we're using digital marketing and we're replacing essentially a lot of the activity done by a human, by a manager, with AI. And this led to a 76% increase in return on ad spend within just three months. So the manager originally was deciding what ads to place where, for whom, and how much to spend. And the AI decided that it was going to target women over the age of 55, even though they weren't in the target segment. So the digital marketing manager thought, okay, well, we're only going to target who our target buyers are, and we're going to omit these people. But the AI decided to do it because it turns out that women over 55 are buying gifts for their children, for nieces, for grandchildren. And it turned out to be a very lucrative segment. So this is a case where AI was able to be more effective than a human. You can't micromanage one set of variables such as ad frequency. 
when you're trying to do this manually, because what AI is doing is it's factoring in many different variables, the time of day, the person that it is, the past behavior of that person. There are just so many things up in the air that it's very difficult for a human to keep track of all that data. Now, there's a lot of enthusiasm for AI, and a lot of that is coming from the tech world. It's coming from Baidu, it's coming from Google, Amazon, etc. But most companies don't fit that mold. They're not huge internet SaaS companies. And so we have to sort of look at why is it so difficult to adopt AI out of the tech world? And the first reason is that small data sets. Uh, AI relies on often on having large amounts of data from a stable environment and reliable data. And you just don't get that when you're, say, a five-person business or you're in a business that just doesn't have the same economies of scale that something like Google does. So uh, when you're operating a small scale, the other thing that happens is there's a higher cost with customization. So tech companies with these massive economies of scale can invest millions of dollars in developing an AI system because that's going to get spread across billions of users. So it's not it's just a drop in the bucket to some extent. But when you're when you're running a medium sized business, you you can't do that. You would end up needing to customize AI for this scenario, for this scenario, for that scenario. So the scaling doesn't work. The other thing is that there is a gap between the proof of concept and the actual production. And in a lot of cases, this could take one to two years. So uh, it may be very easy to come up with a, a kind of a prototype of how AI could be applied, but actually getting that uh, to hit the road in the real world, much more difficult. And, and in the tech world, often we're just dealing with software where it's easy to roll things out in a sprint. Uh, you can't do that if you're dealing with uh, complex supply chains, you're dealing with manufacturing that could take months to, to roll something out, or you're dealing with comp complex uh, infrastructure. Now, one of the biggest bottlenecks with AI is really getting the right data to feed to the software. And I, I mentioned earlier that that's one of the biggest limitations of smaller businesses is they just don't have enough data. So AI is less of a strong use case for them. Now, AI automating admin is one of the primary benefits. And not only does it increase your productivity, but it also increases morale because managers at all levels spend the majority of their time, believe it or not, on admin. So over 50% of the time is spent on things like scheduling shifts, writing reports, tracking sources, filling out online forums, summarizing documents repetitive types of things that could be done by AI. So for example, um, one one of the things that I've seen working in large companies now is the, these expense, expense software that uses AI and extract, extracts data from receipts so that you don't have to do the tedious thing of filling in the receipts from your trip to London to get reimbursed. You can just uh, get it scanned by the AI. Okay, so what is AI good at? What is it bad at? Well, it's really good at solving problems with large amounts of reliable data. So that's why in large companies, AI is, is a prime use case, less so in smaller businesses. AI is not particularly good at problems that are novel or that lack me meaningful data. So um, that's why a lot of the times with startups, um, you're dealing with novel problems, you're trying to create a new category, you're not gonna have a lot of data to work with there. AI is not gonna help you as much. You just kind of need to experiment and rely on human intuition. Now let's talk about how AI fundamentally works. So there are basically three steps that are happening. The first is feature extraction. So this is where the AI is choosing which data to use. So there's a whole bunch of data out there. How are we going to sort that and decide which which to use? Then there's regularization, which is determining how much weight to put on the different types of data. And then there's cross validation, which is testing the accuracy. And later we're going to talk about how uh, testing the accuracy is is really an important factor because uh, that's not going to work as well when we're dealing with huge uh, time frames. So, for example, customer lifetime value over a 10 year period, you're not going to be able to get uh, feedback in the real world in real time because the the time scale is just too big. Now, let's be careful. Just because AI is good at predictions doesn't mean that it knows what causes the outcomes. And it's very easy to confuse 
predictive ability with causal acknowledgement. Good predictions often rely on stable environments. So um, yeah, for maybe a few years, you're able to make excellent predictions and then something like COVID comes around, completely changes the economy globally, huge disruption. AI is not going to do with that very well. It's not a stable environment that we're working with. Now let's talk about the three ways that AI fits into existing data capabilities. The first is understanding the business. This is the analytics or business intelligence. And often that knowledge really just sits in the C-suite. And um, it's, it's going to be very hard to connect that with AI systems. The second is product data science. So AI used to improve the products itself. So examples of this would be things like spam filters or recommendations through things like Netflix. This is a movie that you'll probably like because you like this other one. And the third is R&D capability. And this is using data to open up new products, new business opportunities, new revenue opportunities. There are four AI management models, and the key question you need to ask yourself is to what degree are humans involved and to what degree are AI involved? And the, the recipe or the composition that you have is going to determine uh, which of these four models you're, you're fitting into. So the first is human in the loop. And this is where a human is fundamentally doing the task, but they're being assisted by, by AI. AI is making them more productive. So for example, AI helps a waste management dispatcher uh, manage routes more efficiently uh, because the AI is able to predict, here are some of the traffic jams that are happening, or uh, here are some more optimal routes that you could consider. The second is human in the loop for exceptions. So most decisions are automated, but when an exceptional scenario comes around, so maybe there's an accident, a human comes in and, and interferes in what's happening. So you're not relying, again, I mentioned that AI relies often on having a stable environment. Well, when something unstable happens, that's when you can alert the human to come in and in interfere. Third, we have human on the loop, and this is where AI makes decisions, but then a human reviews those decisions, those micro decisions, and adjusts the rules accordingly to make sure that the results that are being being produced are actually what we're looking for. And lastly, we have human out of the loop. This is where a machine is monitored by a human, but AI makes every single decision. Now, AI makes lots of mistakes. So how do we control for those? Controlling user input to the system and limiting learning to verified data inputs you can check the AI for racism, sexism, and other common biases. Consider how your product could fail and have a safety me mechanism for each of those. So have contingencies for key things that could go wrong. Have a backup product that doesn't rely on AI. And have a communication plan to address media embarrassment when the AI goes awry with something like self-driving cars. And most importantly here is to keep the trust of your customers. So you can do that by apologizing. There's a tendency to think, okay, AI much more reliable than a human, much more consistent, but you have to accept the fact that your AI will make mistakes. It's gonna make mistakes during the learning phase, and it's also gonna make mistakes during the performance phases. I predict that both the frequency and seriousness of AI failures will still increase as AIs become more capable. And here we have this quote here from Roman, who wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review book. So let's walk through a few examples. An email auto responder, responder that would send I love you to business colleagues and other inappropriate messages. An auto robot that instead of grabbing an auto part, grabbed a human and killed him. Medical AI that classified patients with asthma as having a lower risk of dying of pneumonia. So we can see here that not only does AI make mistakes, but it can make very serious mistakes that get people killed. So uh, you have to anticipate what could go wrong, what constraints do we have to put on the AI so that these things couldn't happen, and how do we mitigate the risk accepting that uh, mistakes are definitely going to continue in the future. 
Look for quick wins with sales funnel optimization or churn reduction. So as you start to roll out your AI, you got to look for the low hanging fruit. And uh, those are two that are going to have an immediate impact on your revenue. So uh, definitely use AI to make predictions about who's likely to buy and who's likely to cancel so that you can intervene. Um, use intelligent lead scoring to know where your sales team should prioritize, which prospects to prioritize. For example, you can use this tool available in Salesforce called Einstein, their, their AI capability for doing intelligent lead scoring. And don't be afraid to move on quickly if you cannot achieve a 10x return on investment from any AI project. I want to conclude here by talking about one of the key limitations of AI. AI works best through trial and error when it's able to rapidly apply and get feedback, empirical feedback. So it's not going to be great at optimizing things like customer lifetime value over five years where you have irregular interactions with customers. So that is one of the main points that I want to make as a marketer is that we're often focused on the long term and we're for focused on the broader market. How do we get more market share? How do we get millions of new customers rather than just how do I optimize and tweak people that are already in my sales funnel? So when you're looking at those big long term efforts to maximize customer lifetime value, to maximize market share, AI may not be the best place to start because AI is going to rely on a lot of empirical data points in order for the system to learn and optimize accordingly.